Welcome to A Look Ahead. We're delighted to have you join us. It's a very special privilege to study the Sabbath School lessons as prepared by the Seventh-day Adventist Church. This set of lessons is for the months of July, August, and September of 2013, entitled Revival and Reformation. This particular lesson is entitled Reformation, the Outgrowth of Revival. So, so what happens if you have a real revival? Does that make a change in you as people? This is lesson number nine for August 31 of 2013. And for those of you who are familiar with our discussions here, we, we prepare some handouts that help us in our discussions. You might be interested in getting some of those hand, one of those handouts for yourself that will give you a few extra questions to ask or think about in your Sabbath school class. Those are available on our website at theox, that's T-H-E-O-X, dot O-R-G, T-H-E-O-X dot O-R-G. So I hope by now that you have your Bible in hand and you're ready to pray with us as we begin our discussion. Our kind and wonderful Father, we have so many things for which to be thankful. And now we look forward to the time when revival in the form of the latter rain will come upon your church and truly reform people truly make a difference in our lives. May we be prepared for it. May we prepare ourselves for it as far as possible by our Bible study, prayer, and witnessing. And may that time come soon is our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Just before you get started, yeah. do, you, do you think that revival <laughs> is the latter rain? Or are we talking about something else here? Revival can happen under a number of different circumstances. But the big revival at the end is, is come, will come under the latter rain. Okay, if we talk about these mini revivals, um, if there are two revivals, a, they will come up. They'll be hopefully prepare people for that ultimate revival. For the ultimate one, have what kind of revival has there been? Can you point to any revival in our church that that had started the I mean, there's 1840, 1888. I, yes, 1888. Is one. But, you know, every time there's that a new general off. conference president, they're always talking about the revival that they're going to have. And it seems like it's the same thing over and over again. Mm -hmm. Is there, is there well, I mean, something. What, what should church leaders be calling for? Well, they should be calling for a revival, that's sure. for sure, but it seems like they do the same thing over and I, over I again. I think and the starting of television stations and radio stations are revivals, because here I am, out in the world, reached by a television station, and so these revivals are going on, and maybe they're not recognized as such. But I think the whole media, the internet, the TV, and the radio are all revivals. But is, is but, all this happening like people are expecting it to happen? I no. Mean, okay, Most so there is a problem here that yeah. we're dealing with. Yeah. So. Well, what, what's supposed to be the result of a revival? Will, will, will people's lives be changed by a revival? Yes. In other words, we're saying a true revival is going to lead to a reformation, a change in behavior, a lifestyle, maybe habits. 2 Peter 3, 17 and 18 says some interesting words right at the very end of his last book. But you, my friends, already know this. Be on your guard then so that you will not be led away by the errors of lawless people and fall from your safe position. But continue to grow in the grace and knowledge of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. What does it mean to grow in the grace and knowledge of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ? To him be the glory now and forever. Amen. To become a better person. Okay. How does that fit with our understanding of the work of the Holy Spirit? Well, it's the way Jesus described those things just by being who he was mm -hmm. that we look at and we <coughs> try to emulate. Mm -hmm. Well, this lesson has three different specific experiences that it wants us to look at and, and sort of analyze and see what we can learn about revival and reformation. The first is a very interesting story found in 2 Chronicles chapter 20. And <clears throat> this happened at a time when 
Jehoshaphat was the king of the southern kingdom of Judah, and Ahab was the king of the northern kingdom of Judah uh, of Israel. Sometime later, the armies of Moab, and I'm reading now from my Good News translation. Sometime later, the armies of Moab and Ammon, together with their allies, the Maonites, invaded Judah. Now, the Maonites were a, a segment of the Edomites. Some messengers came and announced to King Jehoshaphat, a large army from Edom has come from the other side of the Dead Sea to attack you. They have already captured Hazazon Tamar, which is another name for En Gedi. Jehoshaphat was frightened and prayed to the Lord for guidance. So his first response was to do what? Pray. 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 That's a good start. Then he gave orders for a fast to be observed throughout the country. From every city of Judah, people hurried to Jerusalem to ask the Lord for guidance. And they and the people of Jerusalem gathered in the new courtyard of the temple. King Jehoshaphat went and stood before them and prayed aloud, O Lord God of our ancestors, you rule in heaven over all the nations of the world. You are powerful and mighty and no one can oppose you. You are our God. When your people Israel moved into this land, you drove out the people who were living here and gave the land to the descendants of Abraham, your friend, to be theirs forever. They have lived here and have built a temple to honor you, knowing that if any disaster stri struck them to punish them, a war, an epidemic, or a famine, then they could come and stand in front of this temple where you were worshipped. They could pray to you in their trouble and you would hear them and rescue them. Now the people of Ammon, Moab, and Edom have attacked us. When our ancestors came out of Egypt, you did not allow them to enter those lands, so our ancestors went round them and did not destroy them. This is how they repay us. They come to drive us out of the land you gave us. You are our God. Punish them, for we are helpless in the face of this large army that is attacking us. We do not know what to do, but we look to you for help. Quite a prayer, huh? All the men of Judah, with their wives and children, were standing there at the temple. The Spirit of the Lord came upon a Levite who was present in the crowd. His name was Jehaziel, son of Zechariah. He was a member of the clan of Asaph and was descended from Asaph <coughs> to Metaniah, Jaya, and Benaiah. Now this is not the Zechariah who later wrote a book in the Bible. Jehaziel said, Your majesty and all you people of Judah and Jerusalem, the Lord says that you must not be discouraged or be afraid to face this large army. The battle depends on God, not on you. Attack them tomorrow as they come up the pass at Ziz. You will meet them at the end of the valley that leads to the wild country near Jeruel. You will not have to fight this battle. You just take, off your, take up your positions and wait. You will see the Lord give you victory. People of Judah and Jerusalem, do not hesitate or be afraid. Go out to battle and the Lord will be with you. Then King Jehoshaphat bowed low with his face touching the ground, and all the people bowed with him and worshipped the Lord. The members of the Levite clans of Kohath and Korah stood up and with a loud shout praised the Lord, the God of Israel. Now these are the people who normally were the temple singers, the, the choir, if you will. Early the next morning, the people went out to the wild country near Tekoa. As they were starting out, Jehoshaphat addressed them with these words, People of Judah and Jerusalem, Put your trust in the Lord your God and you will stand firm. Believe what his prophets tell you and you will succeed. After consulting with the people, the king ordered some musicians to put on the robes they wore on sacred occasions and to march ahead of the army singing, Praise the Lord, his love is eternal. Does that sound like a good way to go into a battle? With the choir leading the way? When they began to sing, the Lord threw the invading armies into a panic. Does that remind of anybody of anything? What about the bees, the, the hornets, who were supposed to have driven out the enemies when they came in the first time? And the walls of Jericho. I mean, yeah. a lot of times God threw the opponents into a panic. Yeah. The Ammonites and the Moabites attacked the Edomite army and completely destroyed it, and then they turned on each other in savage fighting. When the Judean army reached a tower that was in the desert, they looked towards the enemy and saw that they were all lying on the ground dead. Not one had escaped. So, what does that tell us? If, if, if one can 
engage in that kind of a um, of a of a plea facing an oncoming army mm -hmm. and come away successful like that. Why can't one engage in that kind of an act and that kind of an attitude in the face of an oncoming hurricane or an oncoming tornado? Or let me ask another, maybe a little more direct question. What would happen if a church got serious about praying and then went out to see if they could impact their community? Well, I, it, uh, it, you're it, skirting my question. <laughs> <laughs> it, sounds, <laughs> it sounds though like there was something that had started first. First there was a problem that come. It could be a hurricane or whatever. Then they prayed. They prayed. I mean, they, they actually relied themselves on God. Did I say that right? Yeah. And, then, and then after that, there was a message that came in from the prophet, mm -hmm. and the prophet told them what to do, and they took his word by faith, and they did what he did, what he wanted to do, mm -hmm. him to, them to do. So, uh, Sounds like a good formula. Yeah. There is, there's, there's actually a sequence going here that we've got to kind of look at, too. Just not, okay, a hurricane's coming. Let's go. <laughs> Let's go walk in front of the hurricane and, and... Well, they have days. And what, is the governor, the prophet, he comes and says, you better run? No. Board up your windows? What? Well, that's a choice <laughs> they made. I mean, they, he didn't call everybody, let's go out and have prayer. I, I don't know what would happen. Well, why does happened, it have to be a group? <laughs> why can't it be an individual? Why can't an individual count on? Why can't he read this story and go out and say, Lord, this thing is coming here, and uh, I well, remember this story here, and... Hmm. Well, I don't know if that would make a good impact with it, if somebody individual came out there anonymously and prayed, and then all of a sudden the, the winds turned off and went somewhere else, and everybody would just say, let's unboard our windows, you know, we missed that one. I think it doesn't happen because we don't exercise it. Now let's look at something. Desmond Dawson, some of the worst fighting in the Pacific. Yep. Uh, I, I, know, I knew a farmer in Western Australia when I was a boy. Full crops all around him. And somehow it started. His was the only farm that was left that had a full crop. Not even scorched. Mm -hmm. And he was a, a regular churchgoer and all that went with it. And, and, and I mean, it, it does happen. We just don't get involved yeah. with it because it doesn't go with our culture. Would you say this group of people had a revival and a reformation yep. when they... Well, King right? Jehoshaphat came back and he started doing a reformation in the whole country and that spent the rest of his life trying to reform the, the whole country. So, yeah. I, As I, a result of uh, this event... He saw that partly, God, at least partly, yeah, yeah as a result. saw that God did answer prayer. It looks like a revival needs to have something happen. I mean, well, look what happened. I mean, that was a great thing, having the choir go out in front, and then there's no question there, God did it. I mean, they didn't. Yeah, so it, you, you get a revival there. I don't see any problem with that. Yeah, I think it changes the focus is what it does. Yeah. It brings it right down yep. instead of being. Well, but what? There's, there, there's lots of lots of stories like this in the in the history of the Israelites. Um, <coughs> greater and lesser degrees, of course. But the reformations don't last, mm -hmm. or 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 maybe they do. Maybe maybe a particular generation remembers, and it you know it changes them or something. Um, well, this is a comment from Ellen White once again. Patriarchs and Prophets, page 202. God was the strength of Judah in this crisis, and He is the strength of His people today. We are not to trust in princes or to set men in the place of God. We are to remember that human beings are fallible and erring, and that He who has all power is our strong tower of defense. 
and every emergency we are to feel that the battle is His. His resources are limitless, and apparent impossibilities will make the victory all the greater. Save us, O God of our salvation, and gather us together and deliver us from the heathen, that we may give thanks to Thy holy name and glory in Thy praise. First, Corinthians, First Chronicles 16, 35. So, in this time of crisis, Jehoshaphat led the people of Israel in fasting, prayer, and trusting obedience to God. How might the principles and lessons of that experience be applied to us in our day? Would we dare to just, I mean, what would happen if a group of us did that? Well, let's try another example. Last hmm. week, we talked about um, part of our discussion was the end times. Mm -hmm. Let's go back to the hurricane thing. Okay. Let's suppose um, <clears throat> let's suppose somebody comes out and they and they stand out there and they pray. Maybe they get members of the community. Come on up, let's go out and pray. And that hurricane turns. Mm -hmm. um, how do we know that that isn't uh, something that might occur at the end time? And that's the devil out there performing that miracle. Okay. How, how would we, how would we, well, and then they're going to have this big reformation. Here, here's, the, here's the caveat I would say there. If I understand the book of Revelation correctly, Satan's one goal at the end time will be to destroy God's people. He's not going to be diverting something away from God's people who are doing what God wants them to do. He is going to throw the seven last plagues at God's people. He's not going to be able to destroy them because God is going to protect them. But his goal is to destroy God's people. Well, let's try another story. We only have a limited amount of time. After receiving the call of God to come over to Macedonia, you remember Acts 16, 9, Paul traveled to Philippi, Thessalonica, Berea, and Athens, and finally arrived at Corinth. Paul spent one and a half years in the wicked city of Corinth. I don't know if you remember the passage. After he'd been there for a little time, he said, Man, is it possible that God would have any people, any people worth talking to in this wicked city? And God said, Stick around. I have a lot of people in this city. He raised up a fairly large church. Then he left to return to his home church of Antioch and to do some other business. Sometime later, he returned to his work in Asia Minor and spent three years in Ephesus. We, we know about this story. While there, he received word that things were not going well in Corinth. Apparently, he wrote a short letter to them that later, and that letter is mentioned in 1 Corinthians 5, 9. Now, this is 1 Corinthians. Just look at it. In the letter that I wrote to you, I told you not to associate with immoral people. So, is there any clear evidence that there was a letter written before 1 Corinthians? Yes. Yeah, there's the evidence right there. Okay, there was one letter. Now, it's possible that a piece of that letter is found in 2 Corinthians, chapter, the end of chapter 6 and the beginning of chapter 7. But we're not going to go there right now. That's not our main goal. So what we call 1 Corinthians then has to be really his second letter, right? When this did not seem to have its desired effect, that first letter, he wrote a longer letter which we call 1 Corinthians. Then Paul received word that things were still not going well in Corinth, and he decided to visit there. He probably traveled by boat a few days from Ephesus across to Corinth. Now, how do we know that he made this sort of emergency a trip to Corinth? Well, there's a couple of interesting passages. Look at 2 Corinthians 12, 14. This is now the third time that I'm ready to come visit you. How many times has he been there? Two other times before then. Only one that we know about, unless there was this special emergency trip. And look at, uh, look at the next passage. It's found in chapter 13, verse 1, more or less the same thing. This is now the third time that I'm coming to visit you. So he made an extra visit in there somewhere, didn't he? Mm -hmm. But the results were certainly not what Paul had hoped for. And how do we have evidence of that? Look at 2 Corinthians chapter 2. So I made up my mind not to come to you again... That would be now the third time? To make you sad. For if I were to make you sad, who would be left to cheer me up? 
only the very persons I had made sad. That is why I wrote that letter to you. I did not want to come to you and be made sad by the very people who should, have been, should make me glad, for I am convinced that when I am happy, then all of you are happy too. I wrote to you with a greatly troubled and distressed heart and with many tears. My purpose was not to make you sad, but to make you realize how much I love you all. Now, does that sound like, for example, 1 Corinthians 13 that talks all about love and so forth? Is this uh, letter he's telling the Corinthians to shape up? Sounds like it, doesn't it? Yeah. So Paul returned to Ephesus. After a lot of thought and prayer, he wrote a very strong letter to them, which is probably the material found in 2 Corinthians 10, 13. And sometime when you feel really settled in the truth and you're solid in your faith, go and read 2 Corinthians 10 to 13. We sometimes call that the Sinai letter. That very strong Sinai letter apparently had its desired effects and he was able to rejoice with them because of the reformation that had resulted. What is a Sin Sinai letter? Okay, well this is, this Sinai letter is a time when one of God's prophets sounds like God standing on the top of Mount Sinai <coughs> giving the Ten Commandments. Okay. With thundering and Thunder lightning and lightning and, and the voice of authority and almost threatening. So this is his response after he gets word back from Titus, who, had, who was the one who had personally carried that letter over there. And Titus came back, met him probably at Philippi, and said, guess what? The letter worked. And so Paul's response was, for even if that letter of mine made you sad, I'm not sorry I wrote it. I could have been sorry when I saw that it made you sad for a while, but now I'm happy, not because I made you sad, but because your sadness made you change your ways. What are we talking about? Changing ways? What do we call that? Reformation. Reformation. That's reformation. That sadness was used by God and so it caused you no harm. For the sadness that is used by God brings a change of heart that leads to salvation and there is no regret in that and so forth. So. Now in the first story the people were gathered together to pray in the temple. Mm -hmm. Now the second story the people received a very strong letter telling them to shape up in their church. So are you saying that for revival in our church there's different things that can be done to the church group to sort of kick them in the pants or? Yeah. Now there's a lot of people at LLBN. We get a lot of letters from people with that same philosophy. They send their fiery letters to us for what we've done wrong. Mm -hmm. um, is it their job to straighten you out? <laughs> I guess so. Um, I don't about, know if... Is it about, about this program? Not necessarily. <laughs> There's a lot of things on LLBN. <coughs> but we get a lot of letters that um, try to get us to shape up. Mm -hmm. And um, so I guess there hasn't been any revival <laughs> in the station because of that. Well, let's finish out the story here. Since the Corinthians had written letters and actually sent messengers to Paul, he felt authorized. Now notice the circumstances here. He felt authorized under the Holy Spirit's guidance. So you think all those people who are writing you letters uh, are under the Holy Spirit's guidance? To recommend a number of things to them, and we don't have time to... Well, let's look at some of them. Look at 1 Corinthians 6, 19 and 20. Don't you know that your body is the temple of the Holy Spirit who lives in you and who is given to you by God? You do not belong to yourselves but to God. He bought you for a price, so use your bodies for God's glory. And try chapter 9, verses 24 to 27. Surely you know that many runners take part in a race, but only one of them wins the prize. Run then in such a way as to win the prize. Every athlete in training submits to strict discipline in order to be crowned with a wreath that will not last. What kind of wreath did they get for winning the prize in the games there in, in Greece? Just some leaves. foliage. A little, a little wreath woven out of small branches from a tree with leaves on it. Yeah. That is why I run, Paul says, straight for the finishing line. That is why I am like a boxer who does not waste his punches. I harden my body. Uh, with blows and bring it under complete control. Would that be self-control as described in Galatians 5, 23? To keep myself from being disqualified after having called others to the contest. 
okay, and other places. When Paul again finally reached Corinth after writing his fourth letter to them, and that would be now 2 Corinthians 1 through 9, probably written for Philippi, he spent about three months there. And what did he do while he was down at Corinth for this, his second, well, it really is after that year and a half in Corinth, and then that brief visit where things didn't work out well at all, and now he's back for three months. And what did he do during those three months? He wrote Galatians and Romans. What would we do without those two books? Hmm. Interesting. Well, does any part of our church today need a signing eye letter? Which part would? <laughs> uh, I'm not the kind of person who <laughs> writes letters. Apparently LLBN. <laughs> According to what some people think that Gary said. Yes. I'm sure they're, they feel like but they're being directed by God. God says when you're doing things right in the world, you will be persecuted. Yeah. So if you're getting fiery letters, maybe you're doing something right. Yeah. And then I think you need to search the scriptures and see if you're doing things right or not. Mm -hmm. Because... Um, well, and here's the real question. Why do you think that fiery letter worked when that fabulous letter of 1 Corinthians didn't. I mean, we quote 1 Corinthians all the time. We almost, how often have you heard sermons on 2 Corinthians 10 through 13? Well, when you have kids, some of them respond to love and others respond to Something other a little things. more forceful. So. <laughs> Graham Maxwell had the illustration of uh, when the uh, loving third grade teacher is trying to get the attention of the children when the school when the building is on fire, mm -hmm. she doesn't say, children, children, let's come to order now. She stands up on the chair and yells at them to get their attention so Maybe that she can get them. throw or something. Yeah, so that she can get them out of the building. Mm -hmm. So sometimes you do pretty drastic things when necessary, right? The sign I letter. The sign I letter. But there's, there's, there must be another element here that we're missing to separate, you know, the, the, fiery letters that yeah. that don't do the good that Paul's fiery letter does. Yep. So what well, That's why that I'm be? asking you. I'm asking you. We see, hear all these sermons on 1 Corinthians, the, the book of 1 Corinthians. We virtually never hear sermons on 2 Corinthians 10 through 13. But 1 Corinthians didn't work in Paul's case, and 2 Corinthians 10 through 13 did work. Well, maybe, uh, just for a rebuttal here, maybe 1 Corinthians did work for some, but didn't work for everybody. Yeah. So he had to come back and, and it, clean it, up on those that it didn't uh, <laughs> finish off the rest. <laughs> <laughs> you know, kind of well, dawdling they, along here. I don't know if that's but, that's but correct But let's, let's, let's be honest here. He wrote that letter, and if you carefully read the two letters and you, re you put all the pieces together, you realize that after he'd written 1 Corinthians, and things were still not going well, he made that trip, and they were nasty to him. They were not nice to him at all. To and his face. And, yeah, to his face. He was like he went home with his tail between his legs. So 1 Corinthians is, uh, that's, that's not the tactic to use then? Well, I'm asking you why <laughs> we like... Is that the lesson there? We like to don't preach sermons from 1 Corinthians, and we almost never hear about 2 Corinthians well, 10 to 13. Paul was well grounded in the Bible, and he was, he spoke truth. Mm -hmm. So do our letters, like when you receive letters, is it all truth? I mean... Well, another thing Paul did, he, he showed up a couple times and tried to yeah. mm -hmm. change your minds a different way. None of these people have wrote these letters. I've never seen them before. You know, they just fall out of the sky. And he said, I don't want to make you sad. I don't want to make you sad, but this is for your own good. Mm -hmm. I don't know. It's a, hard, it's a hard thing to understand. Yeah. Well, and at least tells us that God meets people where they are. Okay? God uses other human beings in some cases to meet people where they are. And the people at Corinth apparently needed that letter. Well, look at Revelation 2, 1 to 6. There's a very interesting message here. To the angel of the church in Ephesus write, This is the message from the one who holds the seven stars in his right hand and who walks among the seven gold lampstands. Now, in, Reve in Revelation 1, we identify that person as whom? Jesus. Jesus Christ. I know what you have done. 
he says to the Ephesians. I know how hard you have worked and how patient you have been. I know that you cannot tolerate evil people and that you have tested those who say they are apostles but are not and have found out that they are liars. You are patient, you have suffered for my sake and you have not given up, but this is what I have against you. Notice these words very carefully. You do not love me now as you did at first. Think how far you have fallen. Turn from your sins and do what you did at first. If you don't turn from your sins, I will come to you and take your lampstand from its place. But this is what you have in your favor. You hate what the Nicolaitans do as much as I do. Okay? What's going on there? Well, you know, it's hard to stay in love. Like, when people fall in love, they get, they're just so much in love. And, and you can't maintain that uh, level of love. So, what is God talking about? Our, how do we maintain that level of love? So, what we're talking about here is that God's kind of love is not an emotional thing. It's not a wonderful wave of feeling of some kind. God's kind of love is a principle based on doing what's right because it is right. So they were not really sticking to the principles that they had when no. they first began. No. Well, what do we know about the church at Ephesus? I mean, it was, it was established when Paul was on his way home from Corinth. He had uh, uh, Aquila and Priscilla traveling with him. And he stopped at Ephesus briefly. The people there, apparently there were a few Christians there. They said, please, please stay with us. And Paul says, I can't stay with you myself for right now. I'll come back. I promise to come back. But I'll leave Aquila and Priscilla here. So they started up the church there. And pretty soon Apollos came. We don't know exactly where he had been before that. But he came and he built up the church. And then Paul came back and he spent three years in Ephesus. I mean, man, what, what, what more help do you need than three years of Paul? And then after Paul was killed, the Apostle John came and spent a long time in Ephesus. And yet, what do we read? You have lost your first love. What, what does that tell us? Time for Reformation. Yeah. Why do, why do you think they lost their first love? <clears throat> for the same reason it happened to the Israelites over and over and over and over and over again. What happened in the early years of the Seventh-day Adventist Church? They started with fire and they ended up with uh, nothingness almost. Let, let, let's, let's think about what we know a little bit. I mean, those early people, the, the followers of William Miller, for example, man, they were on fire. They were, when the, the Adventist Church was organized and there was James and Ellen White and Joseph Bates and a few other people like that, man, they were, I mean, they would, they would work all day so they could pray all night and have those Sabbath conferences that we sometimes read about and so forth. Incredible. And what happened about 40 years later? Ellen White said, the leadership of the Adventist Church had become their sermons have become as dry as the hills of Gilboa. That was written March 11, or at least it was published on March 11 of 1890. What makes those sermons dry? Is it because they don't, they don't change with the times? That they're preaching them over and over and over again? People are just throw up their hands and say, I've heard this before, don't you have anything new? Uh, Possibly. Possibly. I mean, well, then what's your definition of drying up a, a sermon? I, I, I think, it, I think it's, it means that people go to the sermon, they come out, they aren't changed at all. They're no different than when they walked in. There's no, there's no nourishment in this sermon. Didn't they kind of get a flat spot and, and, and lose some of their fire? We do also, as I remember, lost some of our prominent evangelists. Just went out, period. Mm -hmm. Yep. I wouldn't consider the whole church... I mean, there's just so many different things going on in the church. There's people that are alive and doing things, and there are people that are sitting in the pews and yawning. And mm -hmm. so it has, it's multifaceted. Mm -hmm. So that cannot be said about the whole church as a whole. Yeah, well, that's true. But still, you know, you have to notice that the, some of these people are falling asleep. 
Maybe you have to change a little bit to get their attention, get their interests. So if, if a church doesn't decide to do that, well, then these other people might just leave and you, you know, still got you the other ones. Class, what is very messy is change. Mm -hmm. And some teachers don't change their lessons for like 10, 20 years because they don't want to change. So do we have leadership that wants the challenge and trouble of change? Or are they into an easy job? And if they just do this and get the sermons over the Internet, I mean, it, it, it's, you know, it's different things. Change... Um, it's just hard. It's confusing, and it's a lot of work to change a class my, like my when you're teaching. My understanding here, Ken, is not that the preachers weren't exciting. It's that their message had gotten, um, well, it was, a, it was a works message. It's, it would be the yeah. way I would determine it. They had, somehow they had gotten away from, from messages about grace and messages about salvation and it was a, they weren't kind of leading, a works-based thing. Yeah. They weren't leading the church. <clears throat> they weren't leading the church. And, and we could read passages that talk about what happened in 1888. And it says the leadership of the church turned back the Holy Spirit, prevented the progress of the latter rain. Well, Martin Luther was a great Protestant reformer. This is our third illustration. He was educated first as a lawyer and then decided to become a monk, much to his parents' disgust at the time. While receiving further education from the Roman Catholic Church, he discovered a Bible in the library at the university. He began to study that Latin Bible and realized that the Catholic Church had gone far away from God's original Christian principles. Luther spent a lot of time reading the Book of Romans, particularly, and you know, passages like He's famous for what he said about passages like Romans 1, 16 and 17. I have, my, my Good News Bible says, I have complete confidence in the gospel. It is God's power to save all who believe, first the Jews and also the Gentiles. For the gospel reveals how God puts people right with himself. It is through faith from beginning to end, as the scripture says, the person who is put right with God through faith shall live. Now, in the more traditional translations, it will say, for I am not ashamed of the gospel. And it goes down and it says, what is revealed? It's the righteousness of God that is revealed. The righteousness of God that is revealed. What, 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 what does that tell us? What is the righteousness of God? What does righteousness mean? Well, righteousness means the opposite of evil, the opposite of wickedness. It means doing what's right. Um, probably it's the simplest definition. So the Bible reveals how God always does what's right. Yep. And then in parallel with, with that would be Romans 3, 25 and 26. Yep. That was let's his, let's go there next. Let's, let's start, I start with Romans 3. Let's start with verse 21. And if you start with the beginning of the chapter, which we don't have time to do, it talks about uh, God himself being on trial. And we say God himself being on trial? Who would, who would judge God? We're judging God all the time in our minds. We're saying we yep. like God or we don't like God. Yep. <clears throat> and we cast a vote for or against God in the great controversy. And the whole universe is judging him. And the whole universe is doing the same thing. Now look at verse 21. But now God's way of putting people right with himself, God's righteousness, that is, has been revealed. It has nothing to do with law, even though the law of Moses and the prophets gave their witness to it. God puts people right through their faith in Jesus Christ. God does this to all who believe in Christ because there is no difference at all. Everyone has sinned and is far away from God's saving presence. But by the free gift of God's grace, all are put right with God through, Jesus, through Christ Jesus, who sets them free. And then these very significant verses, 25 and 26, God offered him, that would be Jesus Christ, so that by his blood, that would be his sacrificial death by his dying on Calvary, he should become the means by which people's sins are forgiven through their faith in him. God did this because... Why did he do all that? <clears throat> in order to demonstrate 
that he is righteous. So, so he did it to demonstrate that he himself, God, is righteous. Right. In the past, he was patient and overlooked <laughs> people's sins. But in the present time, he deals with their sins in order to demonstrate his righteousness. And this way, God shows that he himself is righteous. Oh, and then that he puts right everyone who believes in Jesus. Why would he say three times that he has to demonstrate his righteousness before he can say anything about what he does for us? Because of the law, that you become like the person or thing that you worship or admire. And if you're going to become <coughs> like God, God has to demonstrate what he's like. Mm -hmm. And that way you can either choose to go along with it or go your own self-centered way. Back uh, when you started, just before you said he came to demonstrate, that explanation there, was that what Paul says or was that the uh, translator's... Uh, just before Romans 3.25? Yeah, yeah, there. Well, here, let's, let's go, uh, hold on here. Which God offered him so that by his blood he should be come that part? Or? God puts people right through faith in Jesus Christ. God does this all. Well, let's take one, let's take one of the more traditional translations. So you're saying that God is trying to prove himself to us and to the universe. God is trying to reveal the kind of He's God he is. He's trying to reveal the truth to us, yes. And the truth is about himself and the way yeah. he runs his universe. And that's why Jesus came here. To Look, at this, th this is the, the New American Standard, one of the more traditionals. But now apart from the law, the righteousness of God has been manifested, being witnessed by the law and the prophets. Even the righteousness of God through faith in Jesus Christ for all those who believe, for there is no distinction, for all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God being justified as a gift by His grace through the redemption which is in Christ Jesus, whom God displayed publicly as a propitiation. Now there's a long word that needs some explanation. In His blood through faith. This was to demonstrate His righteousness because in the forbearance of God He passed over the sins previously committed. For the demonstration, I say, of His righteousness at the present time so that He would be just, and that's another way of saying righteous, and the justifier, the one who has faith in Jesus. Now, the previous translation you had, was that the good news? That was the good news. The previous one was good news. I think that, that part of about uh, 24 or something like that, it, it sounded like a lot of uh, interpretation on the part of the Translators. translator. Yeah, they're trying to make it as simple as, as possible for people to understand. Well, since the days of Martin Luther, theologians have spent a great deal of time discussing justification by faith, sanctification by faith, salvation by faith, the righteousness by faith, and a great number of other English-Latin words to describe theological ideas. Maybe the most important thing we need to recognize in all of this is that our part is what? The faith. Trust in God. Trust in God. God's part is justification, sanctification, righteousness, salvation, etc. We do not need to work out the minute, de minute details and differences between these processes. All we need to do is trust God. That's our part. Ellen White said these words. Sinners can be justified by God only when He pardons their sins, remits the punishment they deserve, and treats them as though they were really just and had not sinned, receiving them into divine favor and treating them as if they were righteous. Uh, let me just give an example of that. Look at Jeremiah 31, and I'm going to drop down to verse 33. The new covenant that I will make with the people of Israel will be this. I will put my law within them and write it on their hearts. I will be their God and they will be my people. None of them will have to teach his fellow citizen to know the Lord uh, because all will know me from the least to the greatest. I will forgive their sins and I will no longer remember their wrongs. What's going to happen to their wrongs? going to be forgotten. God says, now this, this, is there something wrong with God's memory? He says, I'm not going to bring it up to you again. Yeah. I'm not going to irritate he, you. Yeah, exactly. He, he just goes, says, we're not going to talk about it. If you come up and tell God, you know, God, I'm so sorry. I did. What are you talking about? I'm not interested in talking about what you did before. I distinctly remember forgetting that. Yes, as one of our friends used to say. And then God is going to change our heart. We mm -hmm. don't have to change our heart. We just look to God, and He changes our heart. We have to change our mind. Our mm -hmm. mind. Of course, the heart is where you really do your thinking, isn't it? Yeah. Biblical. Yeah. 
Yeah. So. <laughs> well, they are justified alone through the imputed righteousness of Christ, using some of those long Latin words. The Father accepts the Son, and through ato the atoning sacrifice of His Son, accepts the sinner. So, what is the relationship then between grace and faith? Grace isn't some kind of commodity that can be bottled up and you pour out a little bit when you need it. Grace is a description of our gracious God. You can't have grace without a person being gracious. Look at Romans 2.4. It says that very specifically. Or perhaps you despise His great kindness, tolerance, and patience. Surely you know that God is kind because He's trying to lead you to repentance. In the more traditional translations, it's God's kindness leads you to repentance. So getting a clearer picture of God's grace and understanding is a life-transforming experience. Jesus himself said that life eternal comes from knowing God, the famous John 17, 3 verse. So what is the relationship between revival and reformation and getting to know God better? So if a pastor wants a revival and reformation, he should preach about God and teach his congregation about God better? Mm -hmm. Teach them that God is gracious. He's gracious to everybody. And that grace is not a commodity that he parcels out of here and little in there, there a little. It's the way God is. Yeah. In light of what we have learned from these three stories, how do we grow in grace? Do we need Sinai letters? Do we need miraculous battle? Take, uh, Growing in grace, that's, a, that's an interesting term. Mm -hmm. the, grace, the, only, the only real grace we know is, is the grace of God. What so growing in grace means to become more like God. Satan is doing everything he possibly can to prevent the knowledge of God from spreading throughout the earth. He knows that when people learn the truth about God, what's going to happen? His days are numbered. Consider these words from Ellen White about the life of Jesus. This is an absolutely incredible passage, which is very seldom quoted. It's found in, Janu in Signs of the Time, January 20 of 1890. The law of Jehovah was burdened. Now, this is talking about in the times of Jesus. The law of Jehovah was burdened with needless exactions and traditions. And God was represented as severe, exacting, revengeful, and arbitrary. Does anybody think God is like that today? Many do. Why? What, 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 what would make you think that God is severe, the exacting? The doctrine of hell. What Very about the doctrine God. of hell? Absolutely. And what about someone who kills you because God told them to? Yeah. Well, God was pictured as one who could take pleasure in the sufferings of his creatures. There's hell. The very attributes that belong to the character of Satan, the evil one represented as belonging to the character of God. So what's going on here? Satan wants us to believe that he is the one who's like God, and that God is like him, like he really is. That's one of the things that makes him very jealous, is that yeah. we get to be like God. We were actually even created in God's image, and mm -hmm. To the extent that we have the ability to create ourselves, and he doesn't. Yeah. Well, Jesus came. Jesus came now. Why did Jesus come to this earth? Did he come to pay the price, as many believe? Well, listen to this. Jesus came to teach men, and women, of course, of the Father. To correctly represent him before the fallen children of earth. What was Jesus' purpose for coming to this earth? As a teacher. To teach what he, only he could teach, the truth about God. When you see me, you have seen God. Yeah. Angels. It, yeah. Sorry to interrupt you. It kind That's of right. seems the opposite a little bit of Paul's letter, mm -hmm. the Sinai letter. We've got the Sinai letter early, and then Jesus is just pure love, mm -hmm. giving of himself, serving the people, serving the apostles, washing their feet. Mm -hmm. Feeding the people. Yeah. Angels could not fully portray the character of God, but Christ, who was a living impersonation of God, could not fail to accomplish the work. And notice these incredible words. The only way in which he could set and keep men and women right 
was to make himself visible and familiar to their eyes. How is God trying to keep us set and keep right? Well, there's another word for that. Isn't there a long Latin word for that? That's the word justification. And keep right is sanctification. Set right is justification. Keep right is sanctification. The only way in which he could set and keep men right was to make himself visible and familiar to their eyes. In other words, Christ's main job was to picture God for us. Show us what God is like. Christ exalted the character of God, attributed to, attributing to him the praise and giving to him the credit of the whole purpose. How much of the purpose? The whole purpose. The whole purpose of his own mission on earth to set men right through what? The revelation of God. <clears throat> In Christ was arrayed before men the paternal grace and the matchless perfections of the Father. In his prayer, just before his crucifixion, he declared, I have manifested thy name, I have glorified thee on the earth, I have finished the work which thou gavest me to do. Now there are a lot of people, a lot of Christians who will tell you his one job for coming to this earth was to sacrifice himself so that those precious drops of blood would serve for their atonement. Jesus said he finished his work before he'd even died. And he never, now, that's ever, not to say that there wasn't any purpose for the crucifixion. I'm sorry. And he never at once that I could find in the Gospels where he says, you know, one of these days I'm going to pay your penalty for you. Yeah. I'm going to die and you're all going to be paid up. Mm -hmm. It ain't there. Yeah, he, it cost him. He did what the, what the sacrificial system did be, and the sacrificial system was established because of, uh, of yeah. lawlessness. But, well, when the object of his mission was attained, the revelation of God to the world. How many times does she need to say this in just blunt words? The Son of God announced that his work was accomplished and that the character of the Father was made manifest to men. Wow. Signs of the Times, January 20, 1890. Well, really, when you look at it, if we did not have Jesus who came to this earth, what kind of picture would we have yeah. of God? Yeah. Well, if that was the whole purpose of Jesus' mission, what should be our purpose? Oh dear, to look like God to other people. You remember what it says in Matthew 5, verse 16? Maybe we should look at that for a second. Matthew 5, 16. Remember those words? In the same way, your light must shine before people so that they will see the good things you do and praise your Father in heaven. Who are they seeing in you? God the Father. The Father. They are seeing God in you. That's what Christians are supposed to be like. Well, Seventh-day Adventists have always stated that our end-time message to the world is found in Revelation 14, 6-12. That's, of course, the three angels' messages. We believe that the pre-advent judgment is taking place as we speak, right now. We also believe that God has commissioned us to call faithful people out of the other communions to join our church. But despite their Bible studies, the early Adventists were not quite sure what to do with the third angel's message. This time is coming when, as Revelation 13, 16, and 17 tell us, Satan and his side will, side will mastermind things so that we will not be able to buy or sell unless we have the mark of the beast. The third angel's message is God's response to that threat from Satan. God doesn't just come out of the blue with a third angel's message. This is a response to the fact that Satan has said, anybody who doesn't go along with my plan is going to die. And God says, no, not true. Anybody who doesn't go along with my plan is going to die. But we will never reach that spot, at least during our lifetimes, unless we can learn to experience how to have true revival and reformation. After quoting the Laodicean message, now who does that apply to? Us today, we're kind of looking Adventists have taught that the Laodicean message is a message that largely represents what's going on in God's final end time church. So here's her comments. These are found in um, Review, and, uh, Review and Herald, February 25, 1902. 
And by God's church, you mean the Christian church at large? The Christian church at large. God calls for a spiritual revival and spiritual reformation. Unless this takes place, those who are lukewarm, remember the 13, I mean the legacy and message, will continue to grow more abhorrent to the Lord until he refu will refuse to acknowledge them as his children. A revival and a reformation must take place. Under the ministration of the Holy Spirit, revival and reformation are two different things. Revival signifies a renewal of spiritual life, a quickening of the powers of mind and heart, a resurrection from spiritual death. Reformation signifies a reorganization, a change in ideas and theories, habits and practices. Reformation will not bring forth the good fruit of righteousness unless it is connected with the revival of the Spirit. Revival and Reformation are to do their appointed work, and in doing this work, they must blend. Review and Herald, February 25, 1902. When we come to know God as it is our privilege to know Him, we will learn to do right because it is right. Again, Great Controversy, page 460. We should choose the right because it is right and leave the consequences with God. To men of principle, faith, and daring, the world is indebted for its great reforms. By such men, the work of reform for this time must be carried forward. Great Controversy 460. I think she's made it pretty clear what we're supposed to do, hasn't she? Mm -hmm. God is making an individual and personal appeal to each one of us to make a commitment to His side. We need to come to know the truth more thoroughly through Bible study and prayer and witnessing to prepare us for the time when we will be expected to stand singly and alone before the great men of the earth to give our testimony. Volume 5 of the Testimonies, page 707, paragraph 2. Times are fairly easy for us these days. Things will become much more difficult in the future. I can guarantee it. What does God need to do to inspire us to get ready now when it is easier to do so? Then sometime in the future when it will be much more difficult? It is only by beholding God, by liking what we see, and then asking the Holy Spirit to come into our lives, to transform us, so that we can become more like Jesus, that we have a chance of being saved. Our own attempts at righteousness are useless, and these words, what is justification by faith? It is the work of God in laying the glory of man in the dust and doing uh, for man that which it is not in his power to do for himself. When men see their own nothingness, they are prepared to be clothed with the righteousness of Christ. When they begin to praise and exalt God all day long, then by beholding, they are becoming changed. And I have to stop there. Our time is up. See you next week.